What I like about this image is the woman. Like, you don't expect her to be there, right? And this image also reminds me that if you haven't finished cleaning up, or if you don't know how to clean up, then the job's not done. So, how do we find holistic solutions to the problems caused by the Manhattan Project? of large-scale deployment of new technology and the nuclear weapons industry. What is one person's responsibility? What values are most important? And how do we know when to take action? So my grandparents, Enrico Fermi and Laura Fermi, left me and I believe all of us with those questions. And thinking about those questions myself, I started a project I called the Neutron Trail, and I started that in 2009. And the idea of it, it's a cultural inquiry project. So that means we're asking questions and, and learning specifically about different perspectives. So you've heard some of the other speakers mention the complexity of the decision making and that it isn't black and white at all. And so on the Neutron Trail, there's physicists, there's historians, there's artists, there's um, activists, there's downwinders. Um, and so I go occasionally, I'm lucky enough to go and talk to different groups and learn about the Manhattan Project from their world point of view. And in the Neutron Trail, I focus on um, three aspects, nuclear energy, nuclear waste, and nuclear weapons. And I'm not a physicist. I'm in the social sciences, so I'm coming at it more from a humanistic point of view than scientific. Of course, because my grandfather's in Rico, if I meet a physicist or a scientist or an engineer, it's always fascinating for me to learn about my grandfather's work through their eyes, because they can explain things to me in lay language gradually. I've learned that way. So um, hearing these different points of view is something I find very exciting. And just kind of being with the things that don't add up. And I think that's something that's very, very difficult, but it's really, really important. So I was invited to give this talk from the point of view of women, which I've never focused specifically on women from the Neutron Trail. And so that was, that was a neat challenge. And um, I just want to qualify that, although obviously there's gender differences between us, that I think that men and women share more than they're different. And I think it's too simplistic to only think from a woman's point of view or a man's point of view. So with that qualification in mind, in this um, very brief talk, I'm going to give you the headlines about two women's response to the Manhattan Project. One is my grandmother, who after the war became a pioneering activist and um, social visionary. And the second woman is named Marian Naranjo, and she lives on the Santa Clara Pueblo, which is, um, Ruth mentioned the Pueblo. Marian is a traditional potter, and um, one of the key leaders, key women leaders there in the community. And the issue that this talk is really looking at is the impact of nuclear waste on the community. That, that's the second part. But before I get to the main story, um, I just want to take a quick look at what is your point of view of woman? And so we're going to look at some stereotypes, archetypes, and brain research. These seem like satire, but they were serious. The three cartoons are from an army handbook called Tips on Atomic Warfare for the Military Leader. The photo in the top center is Miss Atomic Bomb, 1957. Now on the bottom right is an actual woman and a real family who are working at the Manhattan Project. So looking at these, are, these two archetypal symbols, it's, it's pretty easy to see our basic differences as men and women. So the male symbol going out, or it could be like a sperm, or it could be going to war, or it could be protecting the community. And the female symbol is more like embracing community. And 
there's the, the vertical aspect and the horizontal aspect. So you could think of um, kind of multi-layered thinking. And in December, from the University of Pennsylvania, there's a, a new brain research came out. It was apparently a very large study, and it showed that um, the male brain, which is on top, the neuronal connections tend to be more back to front. There's, it doesn't mean that they don't have the connections going the other way. It just means, in general, the preponderance is back to front. And that coordinates with perception and coordinated action. So if you, again, you think about the symbol, it, it makes sense. The woman's brain, um, we women have more neuronal connections left to right. And that corresponds to um, cross-lateral thinking, integrating linear and intuitive thinking. And I think the, the two women I talk about will exemplify this. Now, of course, the brain is plastic, which means it's changeable. So women can focus more on the, the front to back, and men can focus more on the, the cross-lateral. This is an image I took in northern New Mexico to represent the neutron trail. And now we're going to travel back in time to look at um, things from my grandmother Laura's perspective. So my grandmother was Jewish. She came from a Jewish family. And she met Enrico at the University of Rome. She was studying science. And he was already a professor. They, were, they met in the late 1920s. They were married in 1929. And um, my grandmother helped Enrico write his first textbook. So she was quite interested in his work and also interested in the developments in quantum physics that were happening at the time. Um, when Mussolini allied with Hitler, then um, anti-Semitic laws started to come in. And that put a lot of pressure on the family, since my grandmother was Jewish. And in fact, her father didn't leave. He was an admiral in the Italian Navy, and he felt that he was safe. And, he, and a few years after my grandparents' um, family left, he was taken by the Nazis, and he died at Auschwitz. So my grandmother lost her father to Hitler. Um, Enrico had been getting many job offers, and and when my grandmother finally agreed for them to leave, by that time it was 1938, and he won, Enrico won the Nobel Prize. So that made it easy for them to flee. This is uh, my family. So this is my grandfather, my grandmother, and this is my mom, Nella, and my uncle, Julio. None of them are alive. They, um, they were first, Enrico was first working at Columbia in New York. And in 1940, he stopped talking to my grandmother. There was um, voluntary silence came in um, among the scientists. And in 19, they, then they moved to um, Chicago, I think, in 1941, I'm not sure, or no, 1942. And my grandmother was getting ready for a party. This was in early December 1942, in tent. And um, the guests were arriving, and they were congratulating Enrico. Congratulations, Dr. Fermi. And my grandmother was like, what is going on? Why, why are you being congratulated? And he, didn't, he couldn't tell her. He was, he was very patriotic. He would remember that my family were enemy aliens, even though Enrico had top secret clearance to work on the Manhattan Project. So, um, of course, my grandmother understood the need for secrecy, but it can't have been easy. Then they um, went to Los Alamos. This is a picture of the gate as it looked like then. It was called Site Y. And um, it was run by the University of California on the science side. And even though this poster comes from Hanford, it pretty much speaks to the situation during, during those years. So you can see the women and the children are wondering what's going on. Shortly after the war, the Smythe Report was released, and it declassified much of the information from the Manhattan Project. 
This is a cover of the original Smythe report. As soon as it was released, Enrico brought a copy to his wife, to my grandmother. And um, to me, it just speaks to how important it was to Enrico that, that there be open dialogue. And of course, for my grandmother, it was, I don't know, a shock, but it was, it was a huge um, document to look through. It was very technical. And it, um, she, you know, she was putting so many pieces together as she was reading it, and she was going through the technical aspects of it, sorting that out, and realizing the, the huge social implications of what the atomic bomb meant to our society and our world. So out of that, she began to write books. And the first book she published in English is Adams and the Family. It's a, it's a great read. It's full of anecdotes. A, lo a lot of what I know about my family comes from this book. That's Enrico's slide rule and his um, Nobel Prize. My grandmother said, but above all, there were the moral questions. I knew that the scientists had hoped that the bomb would not be possible. But there it was, and it had already killed and destroyed so much. Was war or science to be blamed? Should the scientists have stopped the work once they realized that a bomb was feasible? Could they have stopped it? Would there always be war in the future? To these kinds of questions, there is no simple answer. And um, that quote still gives me goosebumps. I first read it in 95. My first cousin, Rachel Fermi, published a book called um, Picturing the Bomb, which I highly recommend. It's a collection of, of photographs from the Manhattan Project. So my grandmother is quite prolific, and I really believe that her books in different forms express her exploration of some of those questions. And of course, those questions were the same questions that the scientists were grappling with after the war. And I think this group of people were at the forefront of looking at the ethical dilemmas because they had more time to think about it. In 1955, my grandmother was invited to be the U.S. historian for the first international conference on the peaceful uses of atomic energy. So that was kind of cool because she got to be a fly on the wall at this conference. And um, out of it, she published a book, that book, in 1957. And there were actually Russian scientists at this conference, so there was an exchange across the Iron Curtain um, between the American and the Russian scientists. These other two books I want to highlight, she published in 1961, and I think it's really um, quite telling that she was looking at two figures from in her country, Italy, one kind of representing the dark side, Mussolini, and the other, Galileo, who's of course the beloved father of Western science, or one of them. In 1959, when there was no environmental movement, and to put this in perspective, three years later, Silent Spring was published, and that was the book that's credited with kind of opening up the idea of the environmental movement and needing to look at environmental impacts. So in 1959, my grandmother and um, a group of women friends, other physicists' wives, they started the Air Pollution Control Committee in the neighborhood around the University of Chicago. And so they were really, my grandmother was really ahead of her time thinking that way. Their activities involved lobbying, so they helped to get laws passed. They educated the public. They were the first citizens group to ever testify at a U.S. Senate's um, committee hearing. And the city of Chicago, the air quality we have. This, this chart is it's kind of funny because it, it measures pollution by the way it looks. So it's very, very primitive kind of crowdsourcing. And my grandmother and her group would give this out to people. The, the center part was a cutout. So you would hold it up to the sky. And you could see, you know, if it was a number five dark or a number two dark. And then there was a hotline to phone. And this is where my memories start to kick in. I, re I remember this chart. 
And I remember um, helping fold the flyers for this committee. I was like five years old, you know, I could walk around them at the table. But my grandmother was definitely indoctrinating me to think about issues in society in a holistic way. By the 70s, the environmental movement had started to take off. And my grandmother was looking for the next issue that needed to be addressed. And I'm sure everyone here knows about the problem of gun violence in Chicago. My grandmother and her women friends started the first ever handgun control lobby in North America. So again, a very pioneering effort. My grandmother was approached by a man named Mark Berinsky to mentor him about all that she'd done with the gun control lobby on a local level. And he and some other people took it to a national level and that became the Brady campaign. So one of, that's one of the legacies of her life. And the other one, of course, is especially in the environmental movement as, as one of the seeds of that movement. So now we're, we're traveling forward in time to today. This is what Los Alamos National Labs looks like now, or LANL, I'll be calling it LANL. And in 2006, some of you may know it, they, the Department of Energy, DOE, changed the way LANL was managed. It was managed by the University of California, and they put it to be managed by um, a, <coughs> A consortium, which it does still include the University of California, but it seems to be headed up by Bechtel and, an, and another corporation. So since 2006, there have been some very serious morale problems. I found an article documenting this on the APS Journal, if you're interested. It's easy to Google. And um, many of the scientists have left. The, the kind of open lab science atmosphere seems to have been really seriously damaged. And um, some of the scientists who left have become whistleblowers about some of the issues of, of nuclear waste in the community. So LAMO's main um, task relates to weapons design, maintenance, troubleshooting, and of course that involves nuclear waste, and it has done since inception, when, as we know from my grandmother's story, there was no real significant understanding of environmental impacts. Before I introduce you to Marian Naranjo, I want to um, just give you a little bit more orientation on the area and point out a few more things about the area that perhaps if they had known back then, they might have chosen another spot. Because they chose Los Alamos, it was very, very isolated, and because it was beautiful. They wanted to be able to attract the best scientists to stay there. So here's Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, this is the Rio Grande that gives the water for New Mexico. And there's underground aquifers on either side of the Rio Grande. And then here's Santa Clara Pueblo, where Marion is from. And there's actually three levels of government that interact with LANL. There's the state government, the national government, and the Pueblo government. So, um, Marion lives on a traditional Pueblo, and there's a number of others in that part of northern New Mexico, and together they have their own government. I want you to see the geology of the area. This, does it look like the old, old volcano? Because it is. This is the, these are the Jemez Mountains, the, the caldera is called the um, Baez Caldera. This is the Pajarito Plateau. And it's the traditional land of the Pueblo people. And of course, here's Los Alamos and Santa Clara Pueblo. You can see by the picture, it doesn't, it doesn't look like an active volcano, and it's not. It hasn't erupted in 50,000 years. However, it is a seismically active area to this day. And there's a fault running right under Los Alamos called the Pajarito Fault. Here's Enrico, my grandfather, in the hills around Los Alamos to give you an idea of what it looks like on the ground. So the Pueblo people are a, a traditional people, and they're trying to preserve their way of life. I don't know a lot about their culture, but the little bit I know, it reminds me of the Tibetan people, in that the sacred is integrated into daily life. 
Whereas for us, if we have a sacred, usually it's segmented. Okay, I'm going to meditate for an hour and then go back to work, or I'm going to go to church and then. But for them, it's it's all part of their life, so they really value living in harmony with nature, only taking what they need, giving thanks for what they need. And these are um, ancient cliff dwellings where the Pueblo people lived. And I took this picture in 2010, and it, it also shows the earth is very soft and very easy to carve. So they were able to carve these out. And again, that has a you think about that with nuclear waste, you kind of go, hmm. My grandfather met Maria Martinez, who was um, a world-renowned potter. And um, there was obviously some contact with the Pueblo people, even back then. When I went to, went to New Mexico, and I've been on three trips in 09, 2010, and 2011, I, one of the people that I met is Marian Naranjo. I also met the granddaughter of the potter that you just saw in the last slide, and she's, she's also an activist. Marion grew up in two worlds, and here you see her in the world of her, of her Pueblo nation. She was involved with having this national monument set aside, and it contains many sacred sites of the Pueblo people. So that was just recently set aside by President Obama. In the first picture, She's, she's doing a prayer, and in the second picture, she's sitting by um, a corn grinding bowl. And she told me that it just, she just felt this incredible connection with her ancestors when she was sitting there. But like I said, Marion's from two worlds. She also told me that she follows developments in fusion energy. So she's interested in fusion energy as well as her own culture. Um, something else I wanted to say about her. When she was little, she lived part of the time on the Santa Clara Pueblo and part of the time in Utah on an army base where her dad was stationed. So she actually was educated in both cultures. She went to school on the army base, studied languages, um, was made friends with the kids from many different countries of the people that were stationed there. She told me that growing up, that was just natural to her, that there were these two cultures. She didn't, she didn't question it, she didn't think about the meaning of it. I had to make this chart that's kind of like the mind map of Marian because she, she just does so many things. Um, she's, she used to work at Lanol. I think coming out of high school, she worked at Lanol as a low-dose do, low radiation worker. But when she had kids, she wasn't comfortable working there. So she went back to the Pueblo and asked a mentor to teach her to become a potter. And pottery is one of, it's, um, one of the traditional arts on the Santa Clara Pueblo. And she said that it was through working with the clay, that, which is the earth. And her people actually say, we are this place. And the word for clay and the word for human are the same. So it was in working with the clay that she began to think about the toxic releases from Lanol and the impact that that might be having on the health of, of her community and of all the people in Northern New Mexico, not just the Pueblo people, the white people and the Hispanic people. There's actually three cultures. She became a community advocate, a speaker and presenter. Um, recently, she's starting to get some pretty interesting invitations. Last year, she spoke and she was invited to speak at the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. She's also spoken around at different universities in New Mexico. She's a mother and a grandmother, a community leader, and a tribal elder. She's been involved in cultural reclamation projects like that first slide I showed you. In 1979, she founded Honor Our Pueblo Existence. And it's through this organization that she carries out her activities. So some of it has to do with health and the environment, but some of it has to do with um, liaising with the Anglo culture to respect the traditions of the Pueblo culture. And her approach is all about building bridges and relationships. 
She said to me, I don't like to be a monkey wrench. And what she meant by that when I asked her is she doesn't she doesn't believe that by protesting or by kind of putting your foot in the door, putting, trying to put a jam that you can really change things. She's looking at long-term change. So she's been sitting at the table with these, all of these institutions starting in 1979. So she's not just looking at an institution like a blank wall. She's getting to know the people at the Department of Energy and the, at the, at the um, National Nuclear Security Administration and at the Defense Facilities Nuclear Safety Board. And this means that she's reading technical documents. And one of the main roles that she feels she plays is reading these documents and then translating them for the tribal elders and for the attorneys at the Pueblo so that the governments can make um, presentations. And through her efforts, um, and not just hers, I'm highlighting Marion because I think it, it makes it a better, it makes it more engaging to hear about one person. I'm highlighting Marion because she's, I just find her extraordinary. The conversations that I've had with her, I find her inspiring. But really it's a community network of women and men that are, are um, working with Lanol directly to mitigate some of the risks. So a uh, success has been um, two lawsuits under one under the Clean Air Act and one under the Clean Water Act. Just to give you just to give you um, examples, really on this talk, I'm focusing more on the women. And if you're interested, you can email me and I can send you links so you know more background information. One last piece on this slide. The Centers for Disease Control did a 10-year Los Alamos historical document retrieval and assessment project. So they looked at millions of documents, hundreds of thousands of pages. And um, they were assessing from the beginning what, what toxic releases were there and what dangers might there be that need to be addressed. They found six main areas of concern. I'll just give you an example. One of them was had to do with plutonium releases over 10 years being higher than what was safe. There's another one that has to do with the community of Trinity, which if you're interested, ask me in the Q&A. So these women, um, including Marian, live at or below the poverty line. And I think that's really important to note. They're not, they're not middle class people. They're making a huge sacrifice to do these technical studies. This woman here, her name's Lynn Alden, and she made this incredible timeline that shows um, waste stream products, air, land, and water. This is Joni Ahrens, and she's one of the most well-known leaders in the area. She's the head of the Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety. I took this picture in 2009 at the same meeting as the previous slide. And Joni is pointing out um, that from Los Alamos, because of the underground aquifers, if there's toxic materials released into the groundwater that they can travel to the Rio Grande and then affect the water supply downstream. And what she was talking about was tritium, which has a half-life of about 11 or 12 years. And Originally, they thought it wouldn't reach the Rio Grande before the half-life ran out. When I was there in 2009, it was really faster than they thought. I don't know the outcome, but in a way, the point is, just think what it would be like to live under those kinds of uncertainties. There's one more area that I want to um, focus on of, of concern, and we have Enrico illustrating once again, and he's with Harold Agnew, who passed away last year. He was um, a very dear, him and his wife were dear friends of our family. I took this photo in 2009, nine years after a major fire. If fire should ever reach radioactive waste stored at Lanol, the region could become uninhabitable. Large fires in the community also raise concerns about radioactive particles being spread through the plume of the fire. 
in um, 2000, there was a massive fire in New Mexico called the Cerro Grande Fire. And you can see from the top image that the plume went over five states. It started from a controlled burn that went out of control. Now this next little piece is anecdotal. Pretty much everything I've told you I've back verified what the brain told me. But this is anecdotal. She said to me that it was a controlled burn at three in the afternoon and that everybody in the area knows that there's high winds at three in the afternoon. And she just expressed this incredible level of frustration that that could happen. Because her people have been the way they manage and, and part of what they do in their culture is they look out for fires and they have a whole communication system. And yet, when um, people from the Pueblo and the community went to help put out the fire, they were turned away by the military. So there's that kind of tension between security, well, wait a minute, is it still security? And that gets into the complexities of the decision making that go on. In 2011, there was um, a massive fire, the largest, so this is 11 years later, the largest in New Mexico history. It destroyed 150,000 acres. You can see Los Alamos is right at the center of it. The previous fire, um, property at Los Alamos was destroyed, but they were, but no, no toxic material was touched. In the 2011 fire, they had to put all of the in-state and out-of-state resources at Los Alamos to prevent the fire from going to an area where there was above-ground waste stored. And, and the implication from that is that the fire spread further because they, didn't, they weren't able to really spread the resources out the way they would have otherwise. And um, tragically, 6,000 acres on the Santa Clara Pueblo were destroyed. The whole Pueblo is about 50,000 acres, so that means sacred sites were destroyed, their groundwater um, is polluted because now there's a lot more runoff. This is a picture of the Cerro Grande fire, and it's terrifying. And the, these pictures were taken um, last year and the year before, and they show the flooding at the Santa Clara Pueblo since the destruction of the watershed by the fire. And in the face of all of this, because Marion is telling me these stories herself, and then I'm going online and kind of filling in details, and there's just so much emotion. And then she talks to me about her next project, which she's doing with her grandson, that's Marion and her grandson Robert, and her whole voice lights up. She's such, to me, she's such a courageous woman. What they're doing is they've won a very competitive grant from the Department of Energy that you have to, you can apply for if you have a nuclear site in your state. And with the grant, they're going to set up a youth council. And so Marion is the supervisor and mentor, and she's just so excited about passing on her wisdom to the next generation. And her grandson, Robert, is going to be the youth supervisor for this project. So when I was little, my grandmother was always encouraging me to write and to um, be involved with the world and that we all have a responsibility. I mean, we're, I have to say, it's, it was not always easy growing up in Enrico's shadow because we knew we couldn't be extraordinary like him and yet we had to, we had to somehow make a contribution. That was really the message that I got growing up. And I think my grandmother and Marianne exemplify that, and that we need engagement and activism now more than ever, because humanity is at a crossroads in terms of climate change, um, over-resourcing, overpopulation. We have some huge um, changes and issues to tackle. And I think we need all of us, men, women, all of us. And if it seems daunting, then remember these two, their intelligence, their diligence, their courage, and the way they looked at what was right in front of them and took those steps to make the world different. Thank you.
Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, oh, that I mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, so um, in, in one of my earlier trips, I went to a community outside of Trinity where the first atomic bomb test was. And I was horrified to learn that there were communities around there that were affected by radioactive fallout. And it was it was just a piece of the history that I'd never heard about. It's not it's not in the making of the atomic bomb. I don't think it's in the, the histories that we normally read. And the, in the Center for Disease Control study that I mentioned earlier, they were able to go back and verify that this had actually happened. So that means I believe there was thirty eight thousand people living in the community. And the residents were telling me anecdotally, and then at the same time the study was coming out corroborating what they were telling me. So for example, cows would be would have fallout on one side of their body and not on the other. And then the army bought up the cows to try and take them out of the food supply. But, but really the most in a way the most horrifying thing is that the people weren't told to stay indoors. I mean we know how important secrecy is. But they weren't even told to stay indoors, and so when the, and they weren't told not to drink water, not to eat the food afterward. And the cancer rates there are a lot higher. And um, there's the Radiation um, Exposure Compensation Act in the United States, and it covers um, it would cover my grandfather, for example. Like it covers the people that worked at Los Alamos and at Oak Ridge and at Mount and Nevada test site and Bikini Islands, but it doesn't cover the people at Trinity. So that, that community, and I met some of the um, people there in the activist movement for that, they really needed that study to show, to prove what had happened. And their um, congressional representatives have been battling for three or four or five years, I don't know exactly how long, for this group to be included in the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. So we hope that that happens.